Section 10 of The Golden Web by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 1, Chapter 10, At the Theater. The door had barely closed upon his visitor when Dean was back once more in the throes of business, answering questions, giving quotations, receiving offers. The telephone was reconnected and rang out its impatient summons every few seconds. He signed half a dozen drafts, deputed an understudy to receive some of his visitors who were weary of waiting, and dictated several important letters. When once more the pressure had abated and the telephone had ceased to ring, he leaned back in his chair with a little exclamation of relief. The visit of Rowan's sister and her passionate appeal had unnerved him for a moment. He found himself trying to recall her last words, even at the moment when he realized that she was still in the room, sitting at a distant corner. "'Miss Rowan,' he exclaimed, "'why, well, I thought that you had left.' "'I went as far as the outer office,' she said apologetically. "'Then I slipped back again. "'You were so busy that I did not like to interrupt.' Dean rose to his feet. He was a little cramped from long sitting. He lowered the blind and turned on the electric light walking around the room and casually touching the door to see that it was closely shut. Then he came back to his place and leaned over once more toward the girl. "'Why have you come back?' he asked. "'To ask you a question,' she answered. "'Well?' "'Basil went on your behalf to see this man Sinclair,' she said. "'He had a commission from you, had he not? And he failed?' "'Yes,' Dean said, he failed. "'It was to make an offer for some document, was it not?' Dean nodded. Yes, he said it was. You are doing your best for Basil, she said, her voice trembling a little. You paid for his defense, I know. You have promised that you will do all that you can, even now. I thought perhaps I might be able to do something in return. Why couldn't I get this paper for you? He looked at her steadily for several moments. You could, he answered, if you had the pluck. Tell me how, she asked. You are his sister, he said. Presumably, you are interested in his defense. The details of the struggle between those two are, of course, important. It makes all the difference between manslaughter and murder, if a weight, for instance, be held in one hand or thrown. You know the lawyers who defended him? Of course, she answered. Go on. If they apply to the proper authorities, he continued, they can obtain an order to re-examine the apartments in the Universal Hotel in which the struggle took place. No doubt, you also could find your way there. Supposing I tell you the truth. Supposing I admit that your brother did take upon himself a desperate enterprise, and that that enterprise was to recover from this man Sinclair, by purchase or guile, any means which suggested themselves to him, the pocketbook of which you have brought me news. Remember, I commit myself to nothing. I make no definite statement. I simply tell you that it may have been so. It was, she said firmly. You and I know that. Well? You are his sister, Dean said, and you have exceptional facilities. If you could gain possession of that pocketbook, you would be doing me a service which I should find it hard indeed to repay. She rose to her feet. Very well, she said. It shall be done. I promise you that it shall be done. For the first time, when he saw her standing up and realized how frail a creature she really was, a wave of pity swept away his own predominant sense of self-interest. But you are not strong enough for such work as this, he declared. Better let things drift. I can take care of myself. She shook her head. I have made up my mind, she said. I am going to make my effort, whatever happens. You will remember, he said, that my name must never pass your lips. No, don't look at me like that, he added quickly. Don't think of me as a coward or an utterly selfish person. I am here for what I represent. Welfare in this concern or business undertaking. Call it what you like. It doesn't mean only ruin or wealth for me. There are hundreds of us, hundreds who are dependent upon the reins I hold. It isn't for myself so much that I care. Try and believe that, will you? She looked into his eyes. I will, she murmured. I will believe everything, but you must save Basil. 
"'Whether you bring me the pocketbook or not,' he answered, "'I shall assuredly do all that a man can do for him.' For the rest of the day, Sterling Dean was his normal self. He transacted business with his usual acumen. He received his callers and went through the ordinary routine of his position with no indication of any mental disturbance. He had, indeed, little time to spare for thought. At half-past six he was whirled away westward in his electric brougham, changed his clothes, dined hurriedly in his room, and at quarter to nine was in the stalls of the St. James Theatre, sitting between Lady Olive and her mother. The mechanical part of the day's arrangements he had found it easy enough to carry out, but to keep his thoughts engrossed upon his surroundings was a sheer impossibility. He was not even conscious when the curtain went down until he found Lady Olive's eyes fixed curiously upon him. Sterling, she said, I don't think I like you when you have been at the office all day. Tell me, what can there be about this money-making so engrossing that you carry it about with you after you have finished your work, like a shadow? He was at once duly apologetic. My dear Olive, he said, if I was distrait for a moment, please forgive me. Consider. It is not my occupation alone which is engrossing. Supposing, for an instance, that I were a politician, don't you think I should be better employed in thinking over an impending crisis than in listening to an exceedingly dull play? Perhaps, she admitted, but crises do not occur in political affairs every day. I might even be vain enough to suggest another and a simpler means of escape from your boredom. I am very justly rebuked, he admitted, holding her fingers for a moment. Only you must remember that this is new for me, to have so delightful a means of escape ready by my side. Give me a little time to realize my good fortune. So long as it doesn't become a habit, she murmured, I am sure. I am not exacting, but I should hate to feel that you were always so engrossed in your thoughts that you did not even realize whom you were sitting next. He touched her fingers once more, and his pressure was gently returned. Then, as if conscious that she had been a little more than ordinarily complacent, she withdrew her hand, and leaning over began to talk with her mother about some people whom Dean knew nothing of. A man from behind touched him on the shoulder. He looked up quickly and recognized Hardaway. "'Come and have a cigarette,' the lawyer said. "'It is a quarter of an hour's interval.' and I should like to have a word with you. Dean excused himself to his companions and joined his friend in the foyer. Well, he asked tersely. Hardaway toyed with a cigarette case and glanced quietly around. He was tall and thin, clean-shaven, with hard pronounced features and sunken gray eyes. Gray hair parted in the middle and a single eyeglass suspended around his neck by a narrow black ribbon. He looked exactly what he was, a criminal lawyer. "'I wanted to have a word with you, Dean,' he said, "'about this Rowan case.' Dean nodded. "'Is there anything fresh?' he asked. "'Nothing particular,' the lawyer answered. "'Come upstairs for a moment.' They found the corner of the refreshment room where no one else was within hearing. Dean lit a cigarette with perfectly steady fingers. There was nothing in his face to indicate the fierce anxiety which was consuming him. With reference to that case, his companion commenced, the facts were all so simple that there was no need for the prosecution to consider any other motive than the obvious one of attempted robbery. Therefore, no very searching investigation has been made into the dead man's papers. Yesterday afternoon it occurred to me to look them through once more, in case anything had been overlooked. I came across a clumsy sort of document purporting to be the deeds of a gold mine. I should not have taken any particular notice of it but for the title of the mine. Well, it was a little Anna gold mine, Hardaway continued. These deeds stated that Sinclair himself was the sole owner. A very extraordinary document, Dean remarked. I suppose you couldn't manage things so that I could have a look at it. It would be quite impossible, the lawyer answered. Mine was, of course, a privileged inspection, and I am going beyond my duty in mentioning this affair to you. It certainly did seem very singular. Especially, Dean remarked, with a faint hard smile, 
since you are in a position to know that I have paid for the defense of the prisoner. It is not my business to connect such facts, the lawyer remarked. Someone will appear upon the scene sooner or later, of course, Dean said, and claim this man's effects. Naturally, Hardaway answered, although, except for this rather remarkable document, they do not seem to have been very valuable. If you should hear of anyone, said Dean, I should be glad if you would let me know without a second's delay. I will do so, the lawyer promised. The bell tinkled. The men at the bar finished their drinks, threw away their cigarettes, and hurried off. Dean and his companion rose to their feet. Hardaway, Dean said, some of the papers are talking about a reprieve for this man Rowan. Will it come to anything, do you think? I do not know, the lawyer answered cautiously. They moved along the passage leading down to the stalls. Dean held his companion back until the little throng of hurrying men had passed by. Listen, Hardaway, he said. I speak to you as one speaks to the dead, because you know the secrets of your profession and because I trust you. Is there any way in which a man of great wealth, who had the command of money, say, up to fifty thousand pounds, is there any way in which such a man could help towards obtaining a reprieve? Hardaway hesitated for a moment. Of course, he admitted, influence is always a useful thing. Those who have the ruling of these matters are sometimes hesitating between two minds. A very straw might turn the balance. Dean nodded his head. He looked for a moment behind. His hand rested upon the curtain which led into the stalls. There was not a soul in sight. The play had recommenced. Hardaway, he said, I will give fifty thousand pounds, if necessary, to have that man reprieved. The verdict should have been one of manslaughter. I am convinced of that. I was in court. I heard the sentence. I saw Rowan's face. I saw the judge put on the black cap, and I heard those hateful words. Up to fifty thousand pounds, mind, Hardaway, and I shan't have your bill of costs taxed. Lady Olive was almost petulant. What a time you have been, Sterling, she said. Do forgive me, he begged. I met a man outside who kept me gossiping about trifles. Tell me, do you think that we can persuade your mother to come out to supper? We've nowhere else to go, Lady Olive answered. Do see if you can talk her into it. It would be very pleasant. I'll try, he promised. End of section 10